uh, it's my proud privilege to uh, introduce today's guest speaker dr u krishnamurthy sir uh, who has been my external examiner long back in 2005 uh, right. during mvsc at chennai madras veterinary college so uh, sir has a, a rich educational background and sir was mvsc from university of agriculture sciences bangalore phd from uh, esteemed cornell university usa and uh, he is avh fellow uh, hnm university germany and sir has a lot of experience and he was a former professor and head department of lpm and former head of division of animal sciences Karnataka Veterinary Animal Sciences and Fisheries University, Bidar. So, uh, sir has a vast research experience and his major work was focused on nutritional evaluation of livestock feeds and ruminant nutrition since 1976 at different institutions in India and abroad. And uh, the most important uh, thing was, sir, sir is an uh, expert in in vitro studies, in vitro rumen studies. So he has worked on several uh, research and development projects uh, funded by university, uh, state and central government, Humbard Foundation Germany, FAO, etc. And he has published a number of uh, research articles in journals of national and international repute. So, such a learned and humble personality, uh, Dr. U. Krishnamurti, sir. Sir, we welcome you for your lecture and uh, we hope that uh, our participants are going to uh, get benefited through your lecture, especially on... So, I will stop sharing of my screen, sir. Thank you, Dr. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Are you able to hear? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes. Okay, now. How to bring my, can you help me in getting the slides out? Sir, there is a, a share screen button below. Green color button is there, sir. Yes. So first you will have to open your PowerPoint in some another window and then click this uh, share screen button. Uh, it's already open. Yes, sir. So you will have to click this share screen button and you will uh, see one tab. Yes, sir. Are you now able to see now? Yes, sir. We are able to see. Just we need to full screen it, sir. Okay. View show button, sir. Which one? Sir, please uh, press F5. F5. Sir, below, below you can uh, see one quadrilateral icon. This one? Uh, right side, sir. Right side. Fourth one. Next, next, sir. Next. Next. On, on the right side, right one. Yes, sir. This one. It's okay now? Yes, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. For guiding me very well. <laughs> All right, Nesh yes, Pandey, thank you very much for the uh, great introduction. Uh, it was very nice uh, to be back and uh, get in touch with you after a long time. Uh, and I thank all of you for uh, deciding to request me to make a presentation. It's a pleasure always. Okay, now the topic uh, I try to uh, complete within the time as uh, far as please uh, let me know if uh, when I'm close to finishing point, all right? In six to seven, so I would like to leave about uh, five or 10 minutes for questions. So I'll quickly go through uh, the important uh, 
aspects of feeding management of goats as a very nicely uh, thought uh, uh, topic, I think, the challenges and practical solutions. Now, uh, the, the, the goat production, because I was just listening to a part of the previous uh, speaker's uh, 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 comments on this whole production uh, aspect. Uh, that previous uh, lecture was very interesting, and uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the, that's the kind of the thing that we should be doing. But unfortunately, we are uh, nowhere uh, closer to uh, what we should be doing. Uh, very challenging new technologies uh, to adopt with goats, uh, the artificial reproduction technique, the transgenics, and so on and so forth. But he also pointed out one thing that uh, uh, we are still having difficulty in getting good goats. Uh, that is the truth. Uh, feeding and uh, getting uh, uh, getting them ready for uh, uh, good uh, good uh, good production or management. Um, now let's take uh, let's see that the goat population in India. I don't want to go to the uh, statistics uh, part very much, but we have nearly 140 million goats and uh, something like 70 million uh, sheep, and they are very important both from the point of uh, food production and uh, um, let's move to the slide. Next slide. Yes, the sheep and goat have the great potential uh, as meat producers because they contribute to the food production, and uh, they are a significant source of gainful employment and uh, also to support the rural livelihood and entrepreneurship. Now, if you look at the situation, for example, if you, their performance is uh, far uh, far below the uh, uh, normally expected performance. If you compare goat production in other countries, we are pretty um, on a lower side. Uh, we have, for example, if you get one kid uh, per kidding, with a kidding interval of eight months, then we get about 150 uh, kids in a year for every 100 breedable dose. And that is probably satisfactory, but we don't have that much because as, uh, as for the statistics, we have about 65% uh, about of the goat population is being slaughtered for meat production. And uh, we get about uh, 0.9 million metric tons of meat from 90 million or 90 million goats. Uh, that is uh, pretty uh, low because the average yield meat yield for animal comes to about something like 10 kilograms. Yeah. And uh, the production, for example, one kid per kidding with the kidding interval of eight months, 150. But if we increase or reduce the kidding interval to seven months, then we can get about 170. So this is what we should be aiming at. At present, it is far less than even 150. We don't get 100% of consumption in the breedable dose. It may be at something like 60 to 70%. So, and if we have two kids per kidding, and then with the kidding interval of same eight months, then we can get more kids, about 300. And if we get two kids with a kidding interval of seven months, it will be still better. And that would be a good feeding management. So this is what we should be really aiming at. We've got to have more, more production, then we can have more meat production, we can have more milk production. So the milk production from goats also is quite significant. And uh, it is about a little over 3% of the total milk produced in India. But uh, availability in the market is not really that easy because it's a small uh, market share. And still, it is important from the point of both uh, fulfilling the human needs uh, and also as a source of income for the rural uh, uh, farmers. Now let's take a look at uh, the importance of livestock uh, management in general, importance of feeding in livestock management in general, sorry. This feeding constitutes a major component of recurring input cost, and it influences the health immunity against diseases, growth, and reproduction, and that is all through the life of the animal. But the feed costs can amount to nil, as in case of the extensive system, wherein the production also is very low. And so it is not probably the best system, but because of the farmer's um, uh, lack of resources, they continue to depend on the extensive system. It's one way of, one, uh, way of utilizing the natural resources, but on the other hand, 
the efficiency of production is much low unless they have uh, the ability to adopt some improved feeding practices. This is what is lacking, and that's really a challenge. Then cutting the, and if it is to be there, if they are to be there under the intensive system, then the feed cost would be much more, coming to almost like 50 to 60% of the total input cost. So cutting feed cost should not mean depriving animals of their needs for a specific purpose. Because in always in the economics, especially in the institutions, for example, as I have been through uh, those days, when we ask for more money, there is always a scarcity of budget. So they say that the animal could manage somehow on the grazing to manage it. So with that kind of an attitude, we really cannot improve the production performance, and thus we cannot have good animals. So the poor economics of supplying or simply saving on the feed is a poor economics because ultimately in the long run, we lose our production efficiency and it's going to be an economically uh, economic loss to the farmers or the producer. Now, most often we think that the sheep and goats are ruminants, no doubt in that, uh, and they are small ruminants and hence they have a different feeding behavior as most of you would agree with me. Um, the cattle and buffaloes are the coarse rapaces, whereas the sheep and goats, because of their small size and different physiological needs, they tend to eat or choose tender rapaces and the sprouts. So the sheep are considered as the intermediate grazers, whereas the goats, they, in terms of the selection, they are browsers, but they also tend to use or select tender grass leaves and pigs as a source of uh, nutrients. So when uh, the sheep and goats are to be there, uh, our thinking that the coarse surfaces can well be utilized by sheep and goats is not right. They need special type of uh, trees which are low in fiber and uh, they are which are relatively fast digested. That means the rate of their digestion should be much faster so that in a short time they can uh, extract as much nutrient as possible. Uh, so the sheep and goats do not perform good with the roughages conventionally used for cattle and buffaloes. And so when we select the feeds, we've got to be make sure that this, the fodder or the concentrates that is uh, fed to sheep and goats are relatively tender and similar to sprouting grasses or the final Tweaks of the trees or bushes. So I don't want to go into the details of uh, every feed formulation and the nutrient requirements. What I would do is try to bring out the, some of the principles of feeding management uh, for different classes of goats. Uh, like I would precisely go one after the other in the next few minutes. First, I would uh, go to the newborn and the nursing kids because they are very important. These nursing kids and the newborns are the ones which are the future breeders or maybe they are the source of meat. And then move on to weaned kids uh, for growth and meat production. What are the principles to be followed in feeding weaned kids? Because weaned kids can be either be used for meat production or they can also be used as the replacement stock for future reproduction. And then the management or feeding of the dose, so the milking animals, um, so that uh, to understand how important it is to take care of uh, their nutrition, to fulfill their uh, production requirement for milk without compromising with their reproductive efficiency. Because often when the milk production goes high, the reproductive efficiency is affected because when the, there is a deficiency of nutrients, especially with reference to minerals or energy. Now let's start with the newborn kids. Now this is uh, a picture. I took a picture specifically of this type of goat and see that the body can to show that how bad the body condition of these goats can be uh, when they are uh, about to uh, produce the kids or uh, about to start lactation. So this is what happens in a few days after their uh, lactation, they through the lactation, 
they progressively lose body weight if the nutrition is not adequate because the lactation requirement is so high and a lot of nutrients are going to be drained out of the body uh, during which the animals try to mobilize their body reserves to produce milk as a result of which their body condition goes down and then the reproductive cyclicity gets delayed and this is one of the very important reasons why there is a delay in the uh, conception and the number of kids born for readable uh, uh, dough uh, during its uh, lifetime. So the first and the foremost important to be remembering with the management of the newborn kids is the need for colostrum. The colostrum feeding soon after birth uh, should be, it should be, uh, it's very important because as you know, the colostrum provides the um, immunoglobulins and the nutrients for the nourishment and that should be done within, preferably within the first two hours. Because beyond the two hours, as the time lapse between birth and colostrum intake is prolonged, then the immunoglobulins are not going to be absorbed intact because of the activity of the enzymes. So the intestines are more porous at the beginning. And the sooner we feed colostrum, the better it is. So it is the first milk after delivery is the colostrum. Anything that is produced afterwards is not really considered as the colostrum because the immunoglobulin content of those uh, subsequent milk or the secretion of the adult uh, does not contain as much immunoglobulin as the first milk. Therefore, the quantity of the colostrum that the young one gets is very important. Uh, it should get about 10% of its body weight. And that is the minimum amount uh, of the colostrum that the animal should get. Uh, so within the first six hours, maybe in two feedings, if we can provide about 10% of the body weight of the newborn uh, kid, uh, then the kid's health will be much better and their survivability can also be much better. But what is the colostrum production? In one of the studies that we did, these took a look at the colostrum production um, in the uh, animals under extensive system. Uh, the clear grassland is not too bad and animals body condition was not as bad as the one that I showed in the previous slide, uh, but their body weight was about 27.9 kg uh, and the birth weight of the newborn was two kg, 2.1 2 kilogram and the colostrum uh, to our first delivery when we measured it, this, the measurement was done by weight, suckle, and weigh method. The animal, the, the, the newborn is allowed to suckle the mother. Before that, it was weighed. And then after uh, stopping of the suckling, the animal was weighed again. So that is how we could measure the intake. This could be, a, a, this, this is relatively easy uh, to measure. So at different times, we measure the uh, weight difference. And from that, we concluded that two hour post delivery, the animal was getting only 30 grams of colostrum. And the animal's requirement at the 10 at 10 percent of the body weight um, within six hours, I would say at least they should get about the 5 percent of the body weight in the first second. So in that case, that should be about 100 ml. But whereas the animal or the kid, the newborn kid was only 30 ml. So this is this is the problem because the colostrum production, the colostrum production is not adequate, then the animals will not uh, get sufficient immunoglobulins, and that can affect its uh, uh, resistance to diseases and also the future growth. So the total in 24 hours, the animal could get almost 10 percent of the body weight. Uh, that is uh, the first meal of the first day's meal. Not really the colostrum, that's the total milk that the animal could get was that much. So this is one of the one of the problems. The colostrum yield of the animal will not be very good if their nutritional status in the pregnancy is not good. So it's important to make sure that during the later stage of pregnancy, the, the dose should be fed well, and especially with the reference to the energy supplements, because the energy plays an important role in putting body reserves 
and also probably have some impact on the other reproductive hormones. And so if the animals are not in good body conditions, delivery, the colostrum yield will go down. So it's important to educate our farmers to make sure that additional supplements are fed during later part of pregnancy. So this here is uh, some information uh, to demonstrate the impact of feeding uh, energy supplement here, the maize grain is fed and versus the lupin seeds uh, were fed. The lupin seeds is both source of energy and the protein, but it has more of protein because the lupin seeds have protein content of 20-25%. Whereas the uh, grain has low protein, 8-10%, but it has more energy. So you see the improvement in both cases uh, in uh, from 145 in the control group, the milk yield or the colostrum milk yield into to 339, colostrum yield into 339. Whereas in case of the animals with the twins, it increased from 197 to 536. Uh, with the animals in the lupin series, it increased from 283 to 502. So, so this is an important thing, both energy and the protein double here. It, it, it doubled more than doubled in this case of maize grain. So it's like a combination of both energy as a protein, or if the protein is too expensive, at least grain supplementation could be uh, the uh, way to improve uh, colostrum in, in, in the lactic dose. So next one is uh, the feeding of the milk. Now, the three ruminants are, the, the, the newborn kids are more like a three ruminants, right? They are called three ruminants and their the stomach is not developed. They're more like the monoglastics, as all of you know. And they have a large um, rumen uh, the, in, the, in the adulthood, but they add, at birth, the rumen is small relative to, relative to the abomasum, right? And it, it is not functional. Human reticulum and omeism are not functional. They're just the compartments. And the abomeism has all the secretory activities. And also the intestine has some secretory activities, not all. But the esophageal groove is functional. That uh, relatively, it is a, a double muscular fold intended for diverting milk from the esophagus directly into the of mesa, where the milk is digested. So it doesn't enter the rumen or reticulum. Whereas the age progresses, the rumen development takes place and it becomes a bigger and the abomasum remains the same size. So over a period of time, the newborn has to depend only on milk. That's usually the case for about three weeks. They have an absolute dependence on milk for three weeks because the rumen is not ready yet to deal with the solid food. So during the first three weeks, the animals or the newborn kids should be fed sufficient quantity of milk. And usually per liter of milk that the kids consume, they can put on a weight of about uh, 120 to 130 grams. Uh, that's the, that, that ratio is pretty, uh, pretty constant. So if we know the body weight of the newborn kids at every week for the first three weeks, we can predict what is the milk yield that they, uh, the dose are producing. So during this period, um, milk is produced and milk is consumed by the uh, newborn birds and sufficient quantity of milk promotes the growth. At the same time, if there is too much of milk being consumed by the newborn kids, the rumen gets, uh, the rumen development gets delayed because the rumen development requires some kind of solid food and the rumen microbes to get established during that period. That is to prepare the rumen to handle larger quantity of the field. So it is necessary to train the young ones to be on the solid food. That's where uh, the tree feed, tree feeding is very important. So most of the farmers do not do this duty 
they presume that uh, the young ones cannot eat anything. But we have done some studies to see how soon these young animals can uh, take to the solid feed. They can take to the solid feed as early as five days. They're not in very high quantity. But if they are provided access to the solid food, then they are always curious to know what is there. And they try to consume a little bit from the beginning, the first week. In the second week, it tries to improve a little more. And in the third week, they really get substantial amount of solid feed. And that is how the, the dependence on milk can be reduced uh, gradually by about uh, three weeks or fourth or fifth week. And if they consume sufficient quantity of milk by about fifth or sixth, by sufficient quantity of free feed by about fifth or sixth week, uh, then they are ready for weaning. The advantage of early weaning, as you all know, is that that would make the dose come back to Easter. So the reproductive activity can begin sooner and thereby the interlanding interval, interfeeding interval can be minimized. So just uh, at birth, the rumen is undeveloped. Rumen constitutes only 10 to 20% of the stomach, uh, whereas the abomenum makes up nearly 80% at birth or soon after birth. If the esophageal groove is functional, closure of certain reflex allows the milk to bypass the rumen uh, and direct to the abomasum. This is an important thing to remember because whenever uh, we have seen some farmers uh, trying to do artificial feeding of milk to the young ones when there is insufficient milk, uh, with the help of syringes or bottles. That is not the right thing because that would go to the, that milk will go to the uh, rumen and that would subject, be subjected to fermentation and that leads to diarrhea in digestion. So the milk should always be fed through feeding water. So the feeding waters would, uh, that nipple, suckling reflex would allow the esophageal glue closure and directs the milk to the abomasum and that is the best way and the right way. So as the kids grow, Roman enlargers, enlargement is stimulated by solid feed and fiber ingestion. But one thing, other thing that we should remember is that the intestinal enzymes are also limited in the beginning during the milk cream period. And the proteases are quite active, the lactase is active and secretion is also good, but not the amylase. There is no amylase secretion because the amylase secretion is inhibited by the lactase during this period. And when the lactase activity declines with the decrease in the milk intake, simultaneously the amylase activity enhances, is enhanced in the intestine. And that is important to remember because in the early stages, if we allow too much of starch in the creep feed, that could lead to problems of digestion and it can also lead to other intestinal infection. So you got to be careful to keep the starch content low or make sure that the lambs are fed with the low starch free feed in the early days, within the first three weeks. The kids have an absolute dependence on milk for the first three weeks. So the kids have an absolute dependence on milk the first three weeks, but uh, that is how it is the typical lactation curve in sheep or in, in goats, uh, especially in the meat producing goats. So the second week, the lactation peak, second or third week, depending upon our feeding uh, our pattern or feeding system, and then it declines. That is how, that is the time where the kids are motivated to be concentrated because their requirement is high but they do not get enough from suckling. And that is the time they tend to start feeding significant quantity of the free feed. So the active digestive enzymes in the intestine are only proteases, lactase, and lipase in the first two weeks. Then amylase and sucrase are absent in early life and activity increases as the age advances. So if we take a look at the composition of the milk, uh, of this uh, of goat versus uh, that of the cow, it is pretty much similar. Uh, most of you are aware of this fact, but that of the sheep is quite different. So, so we'll not talk about sheep now, we we'll focus only on the goat and cow. 
If there are, there is a lack of sufficient milk in the board, we can always think of using cow milk because their composition is pretty much similar and you can straight away go as a substitute for goat milk. So this, this is not the right way, this is the wrong way of feeding. We're feeding this a bottle, so we always make use of the uh, feeding bottle. And once the animals get trained, feeds or lambs, they have absolutely no problem in feeding them. It can also be done in larger scale. It can also be done in small scale in small farmers as well. The impact of pre feed intake on the weight gain. A little bit of data here. Um, so you see that the first week, second week, the and for the eight weeks, the milk intakes gram per day gradually increases and then it decreases from third week onwards, right? So as the milk intake is gained from milk, and this is what is uh, calculated out of the milk intake, the grain is maximum gain what was 56 grams, and then it started declining, whereas as the milk intake declines, the tree feed starts increasing. What we did was we provided tree feed made from maize, 50%, Soybean meal 48% and mineral mixture 2%. Um, that's the protein was high, the starch was relatively low because we kept it the maize only 50%. And we had no problem with this uh, case. No diarrhea, they were digesting reasonably good. And the tree feed intake was very low in the first, uh, first week. And the second week was also not very really much, hardly, it's almost nil, I would say. From the third week, it picked up, and by fifth or sixth week, it goes to 22. This is the gain from the tree feed. So we calculated that 50, 50 grams by about sixth week, which is quite significant and much higher than that animal is gained from, uh, from the milk. Okay, So this is how they take off by sixth, seventh, or eighth week. The, gain from the feed is almost two times uh, more than the gain from milk. This is to suggest that the animals are ready for weaning once they are accustomed to ingest a sufficient amount of solid feed. This will also reduce the weaning stress in the animals. Okay? And uh, the general recommendation is that the time to wean is the time when the uh, kids are about two and a half times their birth weight, that would be achieved usually by about six or seven week. And also they should be able to eat sufficient amount of the solid feed. Now here in this case, we have fed a concentrate type milk. You can also feed the failures. A chaff the hay is often preferred by these uh, young kids. Um, so we got to choose the right kind of food, chop it in a fine, uh, fine particles so that they can pick the, some of them and start eating. Probably the hay is, uh, uh, hay could even perform better than the concentrate. So this is, uh, we just used the concentrate because that was the beginning of the experiment that we did. So we, we, we prefer to keep track of uh, the exact quantity that they can consume. Um, yeah, the quantity of the, of the dry feed they should be consuming is uh, about uh, 0.75 to 1% of the body weight. When they consume that much of the uh, uh, solid feed, either in the form of hay or in the form of concentrate, then it is safe to wean them and uh, uh, put them on the solid feed without any milk. <laughs> So good practice of pre-ruminant kid feeding provide free access to drinking water. That's another important thing so which uh, most uh, farmers may not think that's important because only with the availability of drinking water, the rumen functioning can be better. So then you feed the dry feed, then the consumption of the dry feed will be much better and the rumen development can be faster. Provide so tap hay made from thin stemmed grass or grain mixture from day five and by board, sorry. Uh, go back. Yeah. 
grams. By about fifth week, they should be able to eat 50 to 70 grams of the pig feed. Okay, so this is what happens to the rumen. The solid feed is the one that promotes rumen development. The figure on the left here, you say rumen of the milk fed cow. There's hardly any papillae that you see. It is plain, surface is plain. So the surface area for absorption is very much less compared to the one on the right, where you see numerous papillary development. And that is promoted or stimulated by the ingestion of the free feed. So the free feed can be either hay or a good quality hay. When I say hay, it's a good quality hay because I told you in the beginning that the sheep are uh, selective feeders. Sheep and goats are the selective feeders. They tend to eat the sprouts, uh, the sprouts that is coming from the branches or the sprout that is coming from the seed, which are very much like the concentrate. For example, we human beings eat a lot of sprouts and they are not roughage. They are the concentrates like the roughage, okay? So that is the kind of thing that the animal should be fed in order to stimulate the rumen development in the uh, kids. So starter or pre-starter to supplement whole milk. Pre-starter from one to two months, maize of wheat of 63 nurses, brown and cake, 35% mineral and vitamin clinics, so when kids start eating about 50 to 70 gram of free starter per day, or equivalent to 0.75 to 1% of the body weight, milk feeding can be completely stopped. And stopping of the milk feeding would, uh, the reason why it is done is not, one is the economy, the other one is to promote the dose to start their reproductive cyclicity. And by early weaning, we can have uh, them come to heat early and conceive for the next. It also prevents the loss of body condition uh, in case of the milking dose. Then the starter uh, cereals can be a little uh, lower because the fiber can be higher here and the protein meals also can be reduced to some extent depending upon how the animals perform. But it's very important to think of the vitamin or the mineral premix because most farmers and the most production system, unlike in the organized, unlike, unlike in the organized farm, mineral mixture is not at all fed to these animals. Of course, the tree leaves are a good source of minerals and they can supplement to some extent, but they are not a great source of minerals because the availability of the minerals is very limited from the tree leaves. That's why additional mineral mixture always is better. That would improve the reproductive efficiency of these animals and also the growth and uh, uh, deposition of the meat. The broken pulses, if there are no concentrates or anything like that, we can also make use of broken pulses, which are a good source of free feed for nursing lambs. Uh, the chunis are better, but the chunis often contain the outer coat of the seeds, which contain tannins. We did some studies with the, with the goat rumen liquor to look at the uh, how much of the um, Tannins can interfere with the uh, digestion. It does interfere, but not uh, too much. Okay? A little bit of tannin is not bad at all. It also has uh, some beneficial effect in terms of uh, uh, controlling or uh, having an effect on the fermentation. So it changes the stoichiometric relations between fatty acids. So pulses, broken pulses are really safe. We did feed um, a horse gram, for example from day one to uh, day three to, uh, to, to kids and lambs. And they, they were eating horse gram in substantial quantity. And we found that they were uh, consuming about uh, nearly something like uh, 14 grams in the second week. Uh, that I thought was quite uh, significant because they will not be digesting because they, they were passing out in the feces uh, in, in the form of particles. But it is important to train the uh, kids so that they get prepared to eat larger quantity by about uh, four or five weeks. So here is uh, one uh, picture just to show the um, difference of the um, uh, these lambs. Uh, there are no kids in this. Uh, for the dry uh, wet lucerne and the dry lucerne. So they just try to see the wet lucerne, smell it, and they all move to the dry lucerne. So this is what made us to believe or think that they may be preferring the dried uh, grasses or hay in the early stages. Uh, uh, so that may be the, the way to go. We just have to 
make some more studies and see uh, what is your preferences. So for more information on feeding kids, you can refer to this particular publication. So if, um, Rearing of young ruminants or milk with pleasure and starter feeds. It is available freely on the FAO website. So, let's move on to the weaned kids. Um, uh, the weaned kids can go either as a replacement stock, where we do not expect the two, uh, we do not really need to achieve a, a, a very fast growth when it's the replacement stock. But with, for meat production, we got to achieve a faster growth rate because. They are the animals which are turned out so that you get more space for keeping the next batch, batch of animals. So there is a different way in which the replacement stock and the meat producing stock has to be there. And in the meat production system, we also should be careful to see that uh, our, our uh, desire should not be too greedy to make them go fast because overfeeding can lead to a lot of accumulation of the fat making the carcass unfavorable uh, by the, for the consumers. So that point has to be considered. So in our feeding system, though it is not practical to apply all principles of nutrition in, uh, by making calculation, but there are ways of doing it uh, by looking at the body condition score of the animal. That is a very important tool that all animal husbandry specialists should be uh, taking into account in the management system because it's very handy. And by looking at uh, the body condition of the animal, we train ourselves, we can make a very good judgment as to how to feed them, what to cut, what kind of an ingredient may be necessary, and so on and so forth. So at younger age, the animals tend to grow faster and leaner. That's the, that's the same principle as we see with the poultry, for example. In poultry, the the fat accumulation is very less in broilers uh, when they are about 40, 42 days of age. But if you leave for the next couple of weeks, there will be too much of an accumulation of the fat. So that is why the harvesting animals at the right stage, uh, right age, is important to produce poultry meat. Um, at present, our um, meat selling system is not really that, uh, you know, it should not be so refined, but eventually in the years to come, the consumers will demand a particular type of meat, and therefore we should be prepared to produce such kind of practices in order to fulfill the needs of the society. And that is, of course, also is beneficial to the farmers because when the purchaser of the animal, especially for meat person, butchers, they have their own techniques of uh, assessing the value of the animal. So even if the animals look uh, good physically, if the fat accumulation is more in their judgment, they don't pay a good price. So it's a loss to the producer. So if the producer knows what exactly the butcher needs and why he really prefers to have that kind of animals, then your feeding system can be tailored in such a way to fulfill the needs or the expectations of the butchers, who in turn try to fulfill the needs of the consumer. So this, there are certain gaps here uh, in terms of uh, communication and understanding of the needs of each sector um, in this particular meat trading system. Kids raised for meat should be fed for fast growth, but lean factors. So you just some carcasses taken from this slaughterhouse. You see the amount of fat accumulated here. And also the kidneys. When the kidneys are deeply buried in the fat, here it is partially exposed, but not here in this case. So that shows the amount of fat. And the fat is not something that is expected from by the consumers uh, when they purchase meat. So this is another challenge. What are the um, right age and the right body weight of the animals to slaughter? That's a very difficult question, but it is important to know and come to some, uh, come up with some guidelines so that we can guide the, uh, the farmers, uh, producers. It's another challenge in decision making and depends on the type of carcass desired in a special in a specific market and also the type of animals raised by the producers. So the fat deposition increases when the growth ceases or the growth slows down and the growth slows down as the animals mature. 
So the guiding principle for an ideal weight at slaughter is about 65% of the mature weight to get a lean meat. For this, with mature weight of 30 kilograms, I may say that it should be slaughtered. The slaughter weight should be achieved by about four to six months with about 20 kgs. And it should be achievable by about four to six months as against the conventional practice. At present, what they do, they don't really feed with the challenge of achieving that body weight. But they feed with the available resources that they don't mind waiting for 10 to 12 months because they think that they don't have to spend money. And so it's okay with a little bit of grass and so on. And the problem here is that if the grass's availability is good, if the grassland is reasonably good, then they would put on weight. Otherwise, they may lose weight. That's the problem. So this is what's happening in our system. Uh, this is a plant streaking on the goat carcasses. Uh, the streak of plant is one indication. I'm not a meat technologist, so I do not have much of an idea on the meat, but I, after consulting with uh, my good friend, Professor uh, Nadim Fairozi, who was the former head of the uh, Department of Meat Technology in Veterinary College, Bangalore, I learned quite uh, some things about uh, the meat quality and so on and so forth. These are the fat, fat streaks indicating the accumulation of the fat. If this is too thick, then the deposition of the fat is more um, in, the, uh, in the abdominal cavity. So here it is much more, uh, it is much more as the ceiling of the slaughterhouse. This was done in a controlled feeding study in the institution. So here is another one. It's not so thick, but there is a little bit of streaking. Here is a case where it's pretty lean, actually. No fat at all in this particular case. The picture is not very good, but this is just I want to show you how the differences will be. So the feeling of post wind kids, post wind kids intended for meat production should be without much fat deposition. Because there are some studies conducted even in uh, CSWR, right? Uh, Dr. Karim had reported some studies where we did the challenge feeding to make sure that the uh, broiler ripe, uh, the uh, early uh, growth or the faster growth is achieved. But when the growth rate was something like more than 200 grams, they were reported that there was an accumulation of the fat. So, this is an important thing that we should study and look at how lean meat can be produced and what kind of a feeding system we should adopt. Live weight gain with excess fat deposition does not get a good price, therefore it's advisable to monitor feeding to achieve a DCS. Body condition score could be an important thing to decide as to what should be. Uh, in, in our studies with the both sheep and goats, we found that this condition score of about 1.75 to 2 would be something more reasonable to have lean carcasses. Uh, that is from a limited observation that we made in one of the studies. But uh, I think uh, we've got to do more such studies to find out. Because in Europe or in the US, they, they recommend something like a little over two, because their system or the market demands a little bit more fat in their uh, carcasses uh, because of the way they cook uh, meat. For its Indian market, most of the people prefer to have a lean meat because the cooking system is the curry preparation. The conversion of feed energy to fat increases as the age advances. Uh, this is an important thing because putting the animal on weight after their maturity would require more grains or more energy because a kilogram of corn, for example, can put on a weight of about 300 grams of uh, weight gain, okay? 300 grams of weight gain in uh, adults. But in a young growing animals, it can be almost two times. A kilogram can produce as much as 400 or 500 grams of weight gain because in terms of the energy, this is just translating the calories into the body weight gain. So that is why putting animal or making them grow faster in the earlier age, um, during weaning, soon after weaning, and during the milk weaning time is always economical and efficient. So optimize feeding to maximize weight gain. 
human life. What are the desired weight and in the slaughter? Which I think on the cover. Feeding of kids from three months to from five months to twelve months. That means they are a little more mature. The Roman is fully functional now, and they can be fattened too. So start age for meat varies from four months to one year, generally. For good growth, total dry matter intake should be about 4% of the body weight. It's another important thing. Goats in general consume more, much more than sheep, and achieving a higher dry matter intake would invariably make them go faster. Focus on energy intake by watching the body condition score. For meat production, do not aim for a BCS of more than two. Ad lib are scarce in our system, but it's important to grow legume forests. Um, and we can have the we can have uh, more of uh, uh, high intensity leguminous fodder. This is what uh, uh, we have seen: the high intensity legume tree fodder cultivation. Uh, gives a higher yield, and that can be a very good source of protein as well as the energy. And in general, the legumes have higher rate of fermentation compared to the grasses. And that's another important thing for all these uh, sheep and goats to have the feed of fodder, which has a higher rate of fermentation because they can be digested faster. And so before they are passed out, they, much of the nutrients are uh, digested and absorbed into the system for growth and production. In that lip feeding of grass, the ratio of 70 to 30, legumes at least 30%, the more is better. Dependence on concentrate can be reduced. Hay versus green fodder, I prefer hay as better from the point of hygienic, from the shed cleanliness, and also from the point of feeding management. But the greens are also okay. But the relatively high moisture, uh, they may not like that very much because often feeding of the high moisture greens would leave, especially in the uh, in the uh, uh, animal houses, leads to unhygienic condition, purging, and uh, those kinds of problems. So it's always better if you have high moisture containing grasses to be placed, then better to supplement that with a little bit of hay. So that the dung consistency will be better, nutrient efficiency will be better. Feeding of breeding stock, once the strategy of maximizing kid production, uh, the more kids per kidding, reduce kid mortality and infertility in interval. Practice flushing of those prior to mating to attain a body condition score of more than 2.5, a little over 2.5 minimum. Then they start coming to the Easter cycle. The conception can be better, 2.5 to Three, that is the way I would suggest. Here again, the focus should be on the energy and uh, mineral content of the diet. The good quality hay and grass and legume mixture, with the 70 to 30 with a concentrate supplement, need not have very high amount of protein for these animals, about 10 to 12 percent protein in the concentrate also should be good enough, but you've got to make sure that the energy is sufficient so that the animals would put on some body condition to initiate their reproductive cyclicity. Feeding of pregnant dose, the quantity and quantity of colostrum produced is important and it's influenced by how you manage them during the last four to eight weeks of pregnancy. So aim for a higher body condition, not to exceed 3.5 at any cost, because that can lead to other problems. So the body condition score of about 3.5 should make one comfortable, and confident of having good production of cholesterol. So the change in body body weight during uh, lactation. I just mentioned that in the beginning about the uh, loss in body weight. Uh, here is a case where the animals were losing a body weight of about two two point five kgs during uh, hardly during five weeks of um, lactation. So that is 5% of the body weight. And if they, if they lose more, then it could be uh, very bad for the leaves because that would prolong their reproductive uh, cyclicity. And this is the reason why 
the lactation management of the dams during pregnancy and lactation is important. And also this is the reason why the early weaning is could be beneficial in improving the reproductive performance. Another study again, where the two conditions, one without a supplement, only the animals were allowed to face. And in another case, 200 gram of uh, lucerne was supplemented because we had cultivated grown lucerne at that particular time. And in the group that was fed with the lucerne, the body weight loss was much less, uh, 1.5 as against uh, 2.5 here to give the difference. So supplementary feeding is always beneficial. So how to reduce the interfeeding interval? This is one way to prevent the lactating dose losing body weight uh, with a better nutrition. Um, and also by keeping track of the body condition score, you can make sure that the animals are given the right kind of supplements along with the minerals. So these are half of the high protein tree foliages. Uh, there are numerous our uh, institutions, especially the Glassland uh, Research Institute, uh, um, they have done excellent work with varieties of grasses, both for pasture grass and, and, and uh, legumes and so on and so forth. We can choose any of those uh, for uh, depending upon the region where we are. And uh, the, what I want to say here is that these leguminous tree crops, uh, they are, this is hedge lucerne and um, sesbania, mulberry. Um, Right. Then uh, Moringa, they are cultivated. We did this cultivation under high intensity, uh, the cropping uh, system. We continue to do that. And uh, this is convenient for harvesting. Uh, that's another thing is that the uh, pruning height, we tend to, we don't allow the uh, plants to grow too tall because then cutting would become labor intensive. So we prune them at, to a height of about one to one and a half foot and then harvest the leaves. So we find it very convenient and the yield of foliage also is much better. So this is some of the groundnut fodder, uh, which is we prefer uh, to use this because it's not widely cultivated. And, but the thing is that this is, the, the stem is so thin and the, the small ruminants like to thin stem the grasses, and therefore this could be uh, the one fodder that the animals uh, uh, can be reared on. And the hay, this is the groundnut uh, crop here, which I showed in the previous slide, where the leaves are intact. That's another thing, it's a very important thing. Whereas in the looser, you see more of the stems because the leaves fall off. So this is another advantage of uh, using groundnut. Probably yield is not very really high as compared to lucerne, but I think uh, more work if we uh, do the selection and breeding, maybe we get something good in this area too. So the high forage production system, you know, feeding system, energy, minerals, protein are constraints. Remember, the rumen has to be well fed because when the rumen is well fed then the rumen will take care of the animal. This is the fundamental principle that the ruminant nutrition should always remember. So we've got to feed enough minerals so that the rumen microbial activity will be better. We've got to provide adequate rumen degradable protein so that the rumen is not starved. And we also have to provide enough fermentable energy in the, to the rumen so that there is optimum, optimum microbial protein synthesis which would fulfill the nutrient requirement of the luminance. We don't really need to worry too much about the bypass protein. That is for a very high production level, for the kind of production that we have, we have to focus more on keeping the rumen active. Promote high protein forage cultivation. Uh, I told you already, I want to go again into this. So this is what I was referring to, high density, uh, moringa cultivation example and just giving an example uh, harvest and the pruning height also is kept to a minimum we could have some problems here in the open area other grazing animals may come and use the forage that's another problem that we may such problem does not exist pruning height keeping the pruning height low is always better this is about four year old moringa plot that uh, 
I established when I was working in the University of the West Indies in Trinidad. I was there for the last few years, and that is where I established these floors. So, in the conclusions, um, suboptimal performance of boards under field conditions um, is uh, evident from the statistical data as well as from our field observations. So the challenges for the producers with reference to feeding are to improve survivability of newborn and subsequent growth, increase the milk production, reduce interfeeding interval, and increase the feeding percent. The solutions to these challenges are include feeding with a focus on digestible energy intake during pregnancy to increase cholesterol and milk yield, and thereby kid survival and the kid growth. They introduce creep feeding of kids starting from day five after birth, that is to train them. So by the time they are about three to four weeks, they can intake substantial quantity of the feed to support their growth. Feeding legume powder and grasses with a higher rate of digestion, which is very important to remember, is balanced to concentrate supplement to growing kids because the balanced to concentrate would provide most of the nutrients, especially a focus on mineral uh, content is necessary in this case. The adequacy of feeding for a specific purpose, meat or milk, on reproduction can be and should be assessed by the body conditions for assessment. Thank you. If you have any questions, I should be happy Thank you. Answer. Thank you very much, sir, for a very nice presentation. And uh, I again had a privilege for again going back and becoming student in your class, sir. So right. thank you for that experience. Thank you, sir. Pandey. Yes, sir. You are an excellent student. I have to congratulate you for all the excellent work that you did there with uh, Dr. Thank, thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, we have some questions in chat box. Uh, the first question is from Dr. Kalpana Brua. She's asking that, uh, sir, can we provide cow milk as a whole to orphan kid or other newborn kid? Yes, uh, definitely. The cow milk, whole cow milk is, uh, can go straight as a substitute for both milk. Absolutely no problem. For other kids also we can do, but make sure that you feed it to your bottle. Uh, so the nipple feeding is very important. And the quantity that you feed should not be too much. That means think of about, at a time you feed more, not more than 5% of its body. And it can be done two or three times at that rate. And uh, next question is, sir, uh, please explain the milk replacer. Well, the milk replacer is uh, something that is uh, a substitute for milk. That means it is in a, to be delivered in the form of the liquid milk. The creep feed is different from milk, milk replacer, okay? So the milk replacer, if you want to make milk replacers uh, arti for artificial feeding, the naturally available milk is the cow milk. Okay, that's the also a milk replacer. The replacer that we can prepare is by making use of skim milk, which is about 65 to 70 percent, uh, together with the other uh, constituents like uh, uh, the vegetable oil, that's about 10 to 15 percent. And then we also need to put a little bit of whey powder or whole milk powder, uh, another 10 percent. So I have given all this formula in uh, the, the little manual uh, of the FAO, and you can find uh, different combinations in that uh, paper. Milk replacers, for example, now uh, our uh, National Institute of Animal Nutrition team has developed a new milk replacer. Now, CSWRI also has developed the milk replacer. So I think the scientists uh, from these institutions can be contacted to find out more on their experience. Two days back, uh, we had one question from Dr. Juneja. He was asking that as uh, Harit Dhara was recently developed by NINP for uh, reduction in methane production, it, it is developed as a feed additive for dairy cattle. So he was asking that can something be developed for goats also and what, what can be used for goats for reduction of uh, methane production? Well, in the uh, case of goats, uh, well, milk, uh, methane production can be reduced by different ways. For example, uh, conventionally, a little bit of uh, fat can reduce the methane because it will have a fat depress uh, methane depressing effect. Uh, then many of the tannins 
uh, present in the fields are also a good methane uh, depressor, but not all tannins. Again, there is differences. Uh, for example, tannins from tamarind seed is uh, something that can uh, reduce the methane. Uh, but uh, tannins from gram husk, for example, uh, which we have found has no effect on uh, reducing the uh, methane. So there are differences, but tannin is another thing. Uh, the product that the NINT has developed can as well be used in uh, both if, uh, uh, to reduce the methane and improve efficiency of uh, uh, energy conversion, sure. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, there has been a constant uh, request from participant side for sharing your presentation with them. So uh, sure. uh, we request no you to share it. Yes, sir. On email uh, so that we will share it in WhatsApp group. Oh, yes. Absolutely. No yes, yes, sir. So and I have uh, given my email and uh, telephone number is also there. Uh, any of participants can feel free to call me for clarification. I thank you very much, sir, for giving your valuable time and experience uh, guidance to uh, me as well as all the participants of this training program. And sir, we'll keep on bothering you for different training programs for giving your expert lecture, sir, in the future also. Uh, now, uh, I request uh, Dr. Girish Panchavai, sir, to uh, thank, sir, and introduce the next speaker. On behalf of organizers, and participants, I am very much thankful to uh, Professor Dr. Krishnamurti, sir, as he has spared his valuable time and uh, uh, he was ready to give us uh, uh, his time for lecture, even on a single call. And uh, he was very happy uh, to be with us for this particular program. And we are uh, really blessed, sir, a senior and experienced person like you has guided in our training program and our participants uh, have uh, got benefited with your kind words and uh, your uh, guidance. Thank you, sir. Uh, we also hope that in future too, as Dr. Kuldeep Deshpande said, that you will uh, help us, you will guide us uh, to uh, have the future programs. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very all much. I thank, I thank all the participants and uh, Dr. Panpai and Dr. Deshpande, and also uh, the associate dean, Dr. Bikane, for uh, giving me an opportunity to make this presentation. Uh, thanks to all the participants, and uh, uh, feel free to contact me anytime. I am available. And uh, take care of yourself. Uh, in this COVID situation, you've got to be very careful. You are working hard, and I know that everybody is putting their time to be in the office and. Uh, keep working and be careful. Okay. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much from our university.